Welcome to the Life Writing Podcast, where married authors and screenwriters, Stephen Barnes and Tanana Reeve do talk about writing during stressful times, breaking into Hollywood and balancing life. Every week, we're sharing more tips on how to build a better life while you create your dream projects. Even if it's only at the rate of a sentence a day, life writing is the application of the tools of writing to life and the tools of life to your writing. So guess what? We have a huge milestone to celebrate this week. Huge. Our, our son, our 18-year-old son, Jason DuBarnes, has graduated from high school. Yay! So excited. It's huge. There we go. Huge. Yes, audience. Yes, audience. That is a big, big, super big deal. So, wow. It, it Any really other is just that wonderful. I mean, any other parents have been through this, you understand how awesome it is to have a son who's graduated from high school. Well, it's like there are a serious way in which it ends childhood. Yes. He's not yet an adult. He's somewhere in between the two, because my definition of adult is someone who is self-supporting. Right. And we're not there. <laughs> no, we're not there yet. He ain't cooked, but he's kind of in the oven. You know, I just, I feel like uh, things are all headed in the right direction. He's kind of, a lot of the core personality aspects are set at this point, but ripening them and then teaching him how to apply those things to life. You know, my, my next, the next major phase is helping him create a business where he can take his experience and skills and create a product or service that he can then offer to the audience. Um, you know, just, it's actually going to be some version of what it is that we do here. Right? I was about to say that sounds like us. That's right. Because what we do is we have a product, uh, life writing premium, and we also have things like, um, uh, let's Afro see. Afrofuturism Afro webinar, yes, Black Horror right. Course. Black Horror Course, the Heroes, the Warriors Journey Course that teach different things that we have learned over the years and what we do with our class here with with this broadcast is you get a chance to get to know us to right. get, have a sense of well is the way we speak of these things to your liking do you feel like we're trustworthy do you feel that if you got closer to us you'd be able to learn more of these things and if you do then we make you an offer and that because we make most of our money in Hollywood and, and writing books, we don't really push it that much. You know, we, we will tell you about it because we're proud of it. We're proud of anything that we offer. But Jason is going to have a need to to be more scientific about it. He'll take the same basic notions and he will, I, I believe he's going to be creating a, a course on uh, turning ADHD into power. Just, just you know, ADHD to A's. Um, and I know that from my own viewpoint, it was when people said that attention deficit disorder, I realized he could play video games all day long. He has no attention deficit. He just doesn't focus his attention on stuff he isn't interested in. So it's the executive function to turn that attention on and off, not whether or not he has the basic attention. So teaching him how to do that my thought was to use the same things I do with a writer who wants to learn how to uh, focus their time and energy and talent and, and heart into being a writer. You still have, you, you have to learn things, you have to focus on things, you have to do things. So the, the world in some ways wanted me to treat him as if there was something wrong with him. I just treated him as if, oh, these are just the things that you need to learn to get where you're going. The yeah. thing that I was most pleased about with Jason was when he took uh, agency and control over his own education. Six weeks into his senior year, he started having all kinds of stress reactions to school and finally said, mom and dad, I want to be homeschooled. Yeah. Which, first of all, that was something that we thought about when he was in middle school, uh, when there were a lot more behavioral issues. High school had not had really any behavioral issues. It was just that COVID came. He was on lockdown for like most of a school year. And when he went back, he didn't like it. He didn't like it. He, he His social circles were not there the same way. We were nervous. Oh my goodness. I had to ask friends. This, no clue. I mean, senior year, he had five credits left to graduate. So I was, of course, really worried that he wouldn't be able to graduate on time. But in fact, I do wish we had started homeschooling him earlier as uh, the teacher 
we were his teachers. We had daily meetings. Anyone out there who has, whether your child has ADHD, you have a child on the spectrum, you have a child who isn't socializing well in school, homeschooling can be amazing uh, if you have the right resources. And the program we used is one where they had a graduation ceremony. So we got to go out with all the other homeschooled parents and watch him walk. And I'm telling you, I'm still floating. This was just it was uh, really great. Thursday. I'm still floating. It was so yeah. beautiful. It's going to take some time to kind of sort this out and to, you know, I want to take a look at at the foundation that we gave him and ask myself, how do we turn that foundation into a business? Um, and I think the best way to do that is to look at how I've used that foundation and the elements thereof in my own life. Um, when I'm coaching a writer, the question of how do you use your skills? How do you stay on track? How do you deal with fear? How do you focus on the most important tasks? How do you set up your schedule? How do you take care of yourself in the midst of all of this? You know, the subjects that we cover here, I mean, we talk with with experts, with world-class experts on writing. We bring you these interviews, but hopefully what you're looking for under the entertainment is how are they doing it? You know, what are their beliefs, their, you know, their, their use of physiology? Um, and their behavior patterns, their, their strategies. How do they think about things, feel about things? What do they do? Um, if you can determine that, you can get the same kinds of results that person gets. You're on the same path. So if we've been doing that for school, you know, what I want to talk about, what we want to talk about today is dealing with something that is similar to what he was dealing with, which was the amazing stress of going back to school during a pandemic and the question of how can we as artists deal with stress in our lives, both use our art to help us with stress and to continue our art if if practicing that art is itself stressful. Ooh, that you said a mouthful there. And and just to backtrack a little bit, of course it's always Ironic isn't the right word, uh, troubling, uh, difficult, weird, maybe is the better word when as a family, we're having this huge celebration, you know, my sister coming into town with my niece and we're getting the house ready and we're putting up balloons. And then the news breaks about this mass shooting in uh, Uvalde, Texas, where 19 people or maybe even more uh, were, were killed. Just children and one teacher. Just unbelievable. And did you hear, honey, that the teacher's husband had a heart attack and died? Yeah, I guess I did. So 20 people, uh, 21 people. And then just recovering from the May 14th uh, racially motivated shooting in Buffalo, New York, uh, you know, at the grocery store and so many of the stories. And, you know, I learned from Sandy Hook. I learned my lesson. I'm still scalded and traumatized by photos and stories I read about Sandy Hook. So, one of the reasons I'm not sure I'm even pronouncing Uvalde right is because I have not watched a single video where I'm watching someone pronounce it. I've seen little snippets. I know what happened. I've seen, but every little face, every little face of a child saying almost all my friends died or, or parents being tackled, handcuffed, pepper sprayed because they were desperate. That that shooter was in that school for an hour. One parent I heard climbed yeah, and, over uh, a fence. Good guys with guns were standing around outside, not afraid to go in. And that's so, the second time so don't that's talk happened. About, don't talk about good guys with guns as a solution, please. Right. And this happened in the last uh, mass shooting at a school, which sadly, I can't even remember where it was or when it was, but also there have been police, so many. There have police been like hesitated. There 40 mass shootings this year so far. Whew. So that's true. You know, so, I mean, it, it's if it, one of the things that writing is good for is it, it forces you to clarify your thoughts about what we are as human beings and what the world is. And if you are concerned about this, I would hope that you would have a notion of what you think is going on and what you think the solution is. One of the things that I said on Facebook today is that most of what seems to be going on is arguing, is people saying, you know, this won't work, that won't work, you're stupid, so forth. I would suggest that if you think you have a solution, you should express that solution. You should, you should spend more time sharing your thought about what the answer is than you spend sniping at other people who have suggested answers. That strikes me as being the intelligent thing to do. 
Yeah, and this is very true. And it's very common and even perhaps normal feeling anger to lash out. You know, it's very common to see people obviously lashing out at politicians. I get that. But also beyond anger, I think is a very important step to take when we're facing these kinds of events, because anger is a very disempowering feeling unless it leads to some kind of action. Right. right. Any emotion, so, emotions are, are signals to take an action. Right. So sniping at a, at a legislator is one thing, but also maybe contribute to a fund to help the families or sign a petition or concentrate on what you can do. I think part of what leads to that feeling of overwhelm and stress is the notion of helplessness. I mean, yes, of course, having assault weapons, having the, the gun control laws we have now uh, that obviously are not sufficient is, is a very big problem. And as just one person, you feel like, what can one person do? But just remember, it wasn't that long ago that assault weapons were banned. <laughs> you know, they were right. they were only unbanned in 2004. If yeah, I'm... And the, the numbers of, of shootings went skyrocketed, like just about tripled since, right. the, since the ban went away. So do you have a specific suggestion that you would like to put out there into the universe we've had this this platform if you if there's something that you think would be an answer um i'd love i'd love for you to put it out there well of course background checks assault weapon ban at, at the minimum is where we need to start you know once once we get that going uh, we're, we're in a whole different conversation as far as i'm concerned but i would like to address unless you want to suggest a solution to yeah, this absolutely. problem specifically i'd like to talk about the writing part yeah uh, my specific suggestion would be two. I have two specific suggestions. One is liability insurance on all guns, because that gets the private sector involved in the question and mm. at least those engines of free enterprise. It's like if you have to get have insurance on a car, the insurance companies have done a fantastic amount of work trying to determine how to make cars safer because they don't want to pay out that money. So get them involved in the process. Uh, the other thing is that to the degree that it is true that mental health is an indicator here, we need to have universal health care. Hey. So that every single person has access to physical Okay, now health. you are talking. Absolutely. I so, agree you know, with you. It's, those that. two things are my suggestions. I love it. I love those suggestions, you know. Um, and, and until those things happen, we are, let's say, just for today, tomorrow, next week, what do you do with, with all these feelings and what kind of relationship can you establish between these feelings you're having and your art, whether it's within your art or outside Absolutely. of your art? Oh, and and, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. I, I was just thinking back and I might have told this story on the podcast once before, but it reminds me of being 14 years old when there was a motorcyclist named Martha McDuffie who was beaten to death by police and 12 officers beat him to death and all of them were acquitted. And it was my first realization that Black lives did not matter the same way in the criminal justice system as white lives. I was naively, even though I was raised by civil rights activists, <laughs> I really believed that liberty and justice for all bit. And it was shattering, just absolutely shattering to see such an obvious miscarriage of justice that seemed to be racially motivated. And during that time, there was uh, an insurrection in Miami, um, buildings being burned down, people being killed. They were very, very deadly riots, as a matter of fact. Blacks and whites died during those riots. And uh, during those days of sirens and smoke and feeling like it was some kind of a post-apocalyptic landscape, I kind of felt as a teenager like I was losing my mind a little bit. Uh, that the world was folding in on me. And it was during that time I was sitting in my junior high school cafeteria, listening to Muzak that the administration was piping in because we had this triethnic school, white, black, Hispanic, uh, and they were trying to make sure everyone was calm. So they were playing both sides now, <laughs> or whatever, you know, calm music. <laughs> and I started writing a long prose poem called I Want to Live. And it was, a, it was basically a utopian poem about the kind of society I wanted to live in and that my society was utopia and our society is hell. And do you know why I would consider this a society hell? The end of my poem was maybe it is, maybe it is. And I just felt so much, it was like uh, there had been an anvil on my chest. And when I wrote that piece, I felt it lift. And I went to my mom and showed her the poem and told her about the reaction I was having. And she said, you're so lucky 
Tanana Riva because she always added the extra syllable to not like my name wasn't long enough. You're so lucky Tanana Riva that that you have writing in your life because those people outside who are despairing, who are burning buildings down and firing guns, they don't have that. They don't have that to give them hope. And I've never forgotten that, obviously. It was, it was the moment, not that I knew I wanted to be a writer. I had known that from a very young age, since I was four. But it was the moment I understood literally that writing might save my life one day. Writing, or if it didn't save my life, it would help me preserve a quality of life no matter what happened around me. Right. Have you ever had an experience like that with, with your writing where you felt yourself just leaning on it for dear life? Um. You know, I think that the answer to that is no and yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't think of anything acute. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the death of my mother or this or that. On the other hand, the death of my parents, uh, racism, uh, you know, fear that I won't be able to reach my goals and things like this, show up as thematic threads in, in my work. But I can't think of stories that I wrote specifically. There are a couple of stories that I wrote that I think are pretty angry, you know, come back, come home, uh, come home to Atropos is a pretty angry story in some ways, but it's not triggered by any specific event. It's just triggered by a general sense that people don't understand how much pain has been dumped into certain communities by colonialism and racism and, and so forth. They, you know, it's the, the constantly being amazed when this or that famous person is revealed to be a racist strikes me as being uh, racism. You know, yeah, I, I, I don't even want you to go into it right now. One of my favorite old school movie stars, you just yeah. told me it was racist. And I'm like, no, of course I should have. I, I try not to just assume it about everybody who shows up in a black and white movie. But at this point, maybe I just need to. Uh... I think that you need to assume <laughs> that it is the water in which America swam. Yeah. There were people who were unusually aware and, you know, woke yes. about these things, but that on average, how could the, the history of our country be what it is unless the average American agreed with the presuppositions underneath the actions that created that history? True. Um, I think that if you come to grips with that, it is very uncomfortable, but you stop being surprised when you hear that this person or that person. So, oh, yeah, well, it, it would have to be, wouldn't it? You know, yeah. and then you get to ask the next question. What do we do? You know, how do we how do we move forward? And I think that it, it behooves artists to be lay philosophers, to have a view of what life is, what humanity is, why it is that we do the things that we do to each other, why history looks the way it does, why our current events look the way they do, and what is the path forward. I think that if you feel like you have an answer for that, great, tell us the answer. If you don't have an answer, then ask the question as clearly as possible to the smartest people that you know and get their perspectives. Choose one of those that you like and get behind that. That, that to me, if you look at history, we have been going in a spiral, you know, upwards in, 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 in most ways, I think, um, in terms of being able to deal with each other, communicate with each other, uh, and but we keep hitting road bumps. Those road bumps don't make the spiral descending things the world is more interconnected now and and sociologists tell us it is more peaceful now than ever in human history as difficult as that can can be to believe we're actually getting better so part of what i think the answer is is to clearly state the problem like for instance in this instance we want our children to be safe yeah is it too much to ask that if you send an elementary school student to school that they don't get shot before they come home is right. that too much to ask and i think that there are people who are who are so desperate to hold on to their guns that the only solution they have is locking all the doors and putting the kids in body armor now mm. that is a set of solutions and they should definitely propose that but those of us who think that that's blind we can do better i actually, think, than I that. think it, it begs the question why are Americans uniquely, uh, I don't want to say cowardly, but why is there so much fear that they are so desperate to hold on to guns that they are willing to shut down the instinctive 
the instinctive emotions that exist in human beings all over the world to protect our children. Uh, <laughs> racial history, fear of payback. Hello. I think I think that my, only for Columbine. My answer would definitely be fear of tribal extinction, and some of these people have stated it directly. You know, uh, the you know replacement theory is at the core of this, and a bunch of other things. I think, like you know, from trans rights to gay marriage to religious prohibitions against masturbation, oral sex, anal sex, you know, uh, immigration, voter suppression. A lot of these things strike me as being indicative of a population that is growing more and more fearful of demographic change. And the answer in their minds are guns. Now that is a thought that I have. I can put that out without demonizing anybody. Um, and if I wanted to write something about this, that would be a way of of using an emotion and an idea to drive a process of writing. What is the story I might write that expresses this, especially if I feel like I have an answer? Yeah, I was going to say, even though you don't have a conscious memory of leaning on your writing during, during a time of stress, and I, I don't know if this is true, but I have a theory when I look at you. You're so, some people would call it disciplined. I don't know if that's the word you think of because you feel like you must write, you know? So right, if, right. If, if it's something you it's, feel like- I look at it, it's such a part of my identity that it's more like a hunger than a discipline. Right. You so know, I can't wait to get back to this, you know? What I've observed of you is that you have that hunger slash discipline every day, no matter what is happening inside or outside of the world. So whether or not you're conscious of leaning on your writing and your process, you absolutely do continue your practice and I have to think that it shuts down the noise yeah. of the outside world. It absolutely and it, it does. Was, it takes you into the tunnel. And whether you're consciously doing it to relieve stress or not, it it takes you out. Well, it, it takes does, you out of the stress. Release, stre release stress. Whether I, you know, and there are times, you know, when uh, you've seen me become obsessive compulsive about writing if we're under financial stress. I've got to be working. What you? Yeah, I've, I've got to be working. You know, but it's if unless I'm working on a project, I don't feel right. I mean, literally, it's just I don't feel right. Um, and I think that that relates back to feelings that my writing was the first thing that I had that seemed to connect me with people in a way that I enjoyed. You know, writing and, and performing to a degree, um, but. It, it was such a core part of, of who I felt that I was. And it was, it, it brought me attention. You know, it, it made me, seemed to make me more attractive to women that I was attracted to. Um, so under stress, there's no question that I measure my health partially in whether or not I can write, but I think that you're correct that also it is a way of seeking to remain healthy. Yes, and I love what you were saying about developing a philosophy, not just to guide you in your journey through life, because once you know what you think, and you've identified, then hopefully you would identify things that are along the path <laughs> to, you know, um, actually doing those things, like accomplishing those things that, that are according to your philosophy. But let's talk about it in the artistic space for a moment. I have a novel next year, uh, coming out next year called The Reformatory which is based on my real life family history in the 1930s. My great uncle as a 15 year old was incarcerated at the Dozier School for Boys in Mariana, Florida. It's the setting for Colson Whitehead's novel, The Nickel Boys. Uh, he also fictionalized it just as I did. Uh, but in this case, it was, I got this news that, that the young man had been buried there soon after my mother died. I was already full of grief from her death. And when I got the call from the Florida State Attorney's Office, I thought it was in relation to another miscarriage of justice with, with a juvenile in our family history. My mother had a half brother who was put to death uh, as a juvenile because he was present at an armed robbery is what I understand. And I, my mother didn't even want that story in our memoir we wrote together. I think a lot of times families carry shame about these, these events from history. This was a child put to death, but did not want to include it out of respect for the family and freedom in the family. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to write a short story, which I did. It's in my short story collection called Trial Day, where I rewrote the history because in real life, uh, my grandmother lost all respect, not only for her father, but I think for men in general, because he would not go to the courthouse to stand up for his son. 
he was too afraid. He was a businessman. He was a gentleman farmer. And my grandmother remembered arguments between her father and stepmother where she would shame him and scream at him and dare him to go because it would have brought so much, she thought, shame and perhaps in fairness, even retribution perhaps to the family. But as a young girl listening to this, my grandmother had no respect for her father and the, and the young man died. So I wrote a story where, where he went to the courthouse, right? I, I don't know if it changed anything, but it would have changed a lot, I think, in my family history if he had gone. And in the same way, the incident at the Dozier School, which again is dealing with the criminal justice system, which is one of my pet issues. I just think that we're, we're, we've so overcriminalized our society. So many people are behind bars who, who should not be, in my view, that I do have a philosophy about it. So I could take my my grief over my mother's death, realizing that maybe her father was so violent because his brother was taken away from him at such a young age and, and never came home from this reformatory. You don't know what kind of impact and trauma that had on his family, but he never talked about it. She didn't know about it, I don't think. He never said a word about it. I think that if you're looking at communities that have disproportionate crime, violence, things like that, unless, if you believe in equality, on a genetic level, then you have to look into the environment. What happened? What is the history of this of this culture? Are there historical things that happened to this subculture that can be plausibly held to account for the later dysfunctions? You know, uh, you know, family disruptions, infant mortality, uh, uh, net worth, incarceration rates, things like that. Um, if you if you sh if you damage the root, what happens to the tree? You know what, right. what what fruit does it grow? I think that that these are the kinds of questions that actually are connected partially to that fear of tribal extinction thing. And so, if you feel that you have a a, a positive philosophy about what human beings are and what all of this means you can put this into your art and the art goes out into the world and becomes part of the cultural conversation right and, that's and what if i you learn, if you learn how to do this powerfully you can change lives and save lives well that's the hope you know i i thought about several approaches with the reformatory of course i could have done nonfiction, although i swore after writing the uh, civil rights memoir with my mother i would never write another nonfiction book it's just difficult to research and the, the right. facts get in the way of telling a good story as they say but there were also so many survivors who already had written nonfiction accounts and it didn't feel like my story i'm a couple generations removed it's not the same as someone who personally experienced it, personally fought to shut the place down as, as was happening long before I learned about it. So I decided to take my anger and grief uh, about not just what happened in 1937, but what is still happening today with juvenile justice in particular, and put all of that into a novel called The Reformatory, where I made ghosts so I wouldn't have to show a lot of violence against the young people, but also giving it a happier ending. I won't give away the ending entirely, but the whole point of writing this novel was to give this particular child a happier ending while like Steve said, sort of showing my philosophy of what juvenile justice is, what's wrong with it, um, sort of making people go, wow, we have to do better by our children, uh, which in some ways we are. You know, there have been some strides in, in, in depopulating um, some juvenile justice centers. And, well, and if, I, if, if you say something like defund the police and you have a vision of what you believe that looks like, Writing a story that takes place in a future in which the ideas that you have are implemented so you can, you know, you are answering in the course of the story. This is how we would deal with crime. This is how we would deal with this. This is how we would deal with this by actually showing it in process. Uh, I think that that is superior to being dogmatic in an essay that that if you if you can show us a vision of what that world would be a better world a more peaceful world a happier world i mean star trek became a phenomenon not because it discussed all the problems of mankind but because it demonstrated it showed a future in which many of those problems had been solved yeah i i, I agree that 
unpacking these ideas and storytelling is a beautiful solution because without imagination, you can't take the steps toward that society. But I'm not going to say that the essayists aren't as important uh, because the essayists are the ones who are laying down the steps in the here and now that would take us toward that vision in the future. So I think that they kind of go in tandem. I don't think, I in no way was I trying to imply that essayists are not important. What I'm suggesting is that fiction writers consider that what they're doing is equally important. Oh, okay, absolutely. I will give them equal importance, no problem because whatsoever. You don't have to, if you can create a vision of having solved the problem, you are inviting people to believe that the problem can be solved. And Very that true. is critical to coming up with specific suggestions and also continuing actions when you get discouraged. You have, if you believe you can get there, even if you don't see how you're going to get there right now, you start taking steps. You talk to people who have accomplished similar things. You create images of people who have the courage or intelligence or the capacity to cooperate and create teams of whatever it is that you look at when you look at you know the hero's journey. If the hero's journey was a journey to our children being safer, tell the story of someone who lives in the world in which they are safer and maybe some implications of what you think helped us get there. Absolutely agreed. It's unfettering the mind. It's it's doing what our son did, sort of removing himself from the system to look at it from the outside and structure something that worked better for him, you know? Yeah. So in that same way, an artist can kind of pull themselves out of the existing system, create, this is what's great about Afrofuturism by the way, Afrofuturism is very specific to Black experience and helping to place Blackness in the future and in the past, since we've been erased from so much cinema and literature in the past too. And, and, and I think the same thing can be said just overall as a society that imagination powers change in ways that we can't even imagine. So yes, don't feel like you're not doing enough if you are expressing through art. You're, you're touching people in ways you can't even predict, even if it's just the people in your household or right. a classroom or in your writer's group, you know, much less if you get it published or, or released, you know, when, when it's a film, it, it can just reach so many more people than, than um, many, you know, that was like Fruitvale Station uh, was a great way for Ryan Coogler to raise awareness of these kinds of senseless shootings and, and humanize, you know, someone who's just a victim of a police shooting. So yes, through art is one way to deal with stress. But as we were discussing earlier today, Steve, not everybody can cling to art when they're feeling stress. Sometimes art becomes the source of stress. So then what do you do? Well, you know, in Life Writing Premium, you know, our the, the, the weekly advice that we send to our students, one of the things that we do is we talk about writer's block. Yes. And writer's block from my position is, from looking at it psychologically, is, is a confusion of two different middle states. The, the executive capacity, the, the, the planning capacity, the structural awareness, and the flow state where you are simply gushing out with words um, so it's like knowing what it is that you're going to write and then you flow and you create a thousand words and then the next day you go back and you look at those words and you, you clean them up for grammar or spelling or you look at the structure and ask yourself where you are. So those are two completely different things. If you look at flow, what we're looking for from art is to be able to enter into the flow state. That's, that's a, a, good, a good chunk of what it is that we're trying to do there so it is important to know how to enter flow state how to enter flow state you know like you tanana reeve um you find that entering into flow state for your writing is a refuge for you yeah and it, for all practical purposes never fails you you know i i've never seen you talk about being blocked you just go and you do some research and then you go back and you do some writing which means that you're very strong there harlan ellison had that very powerfully uh, then he later experienced some writer's block. You know, Larry Niven had that very, very powerfully. Uh, and there are times when he can be blocked as well. So well, just full disclosure, there are times I definitely do not feel like working on a project, especially if it's at an outline stage. There's a big difference between the way I can access flow when I'm writing an outline, especially a brand new one where you're still trying to figure out a story as opposed to 
writing, writing, like just, okay, people are talking to each other. I'm in a scene that the character's moving me through the story. That's a very different process. But to your point, usually my writing is there for me. So what you, what we, what I suggest is that people specifically study things that induce flow. And there are lots of different things. There's meditation and there's, you know, there's music and dance and all sorts of things that that sense of falling into the page or time evaporating is really powerful. And you need to find something and then study it so that you can identify flow state for yourself when you need to, because if you're if you're bereft, if, if you are if, if you are bereaved, rather, if, if you are you feel crushed by life and you can find a way to get into flow state, whether you're reading a book and you fall through the page, you're watching a movie and the edges of the screens disappear and suddenly you're empathizing with these people. And it's not actors. It's this thing that is happening. What do you need to do that? Uh, I will tell you that one technique that I borrowed from the book uh, Drawing on the Right Side of Your Brain um, it's called contour drawing and you basically take a piece of paper I'm holding up a piece of paper right now and you ball it up and you take this crumpled piece of paper and you take a second piece of paper and you take a pencil and you keep your eyes on the crumpled paper and you slowly move your eyes along the edges and the creases and as you move your eyes along the edges and the creases, you move your hand on the piece of paper and you draw the crumpled ball. And what hmm. happens is that within a few minutes, you run out of labels for the names of the angles and the edges and the shadows and so forth, and the words go away. And suddenly it's just you and the paper and your hand tracing, your hand following this this crumpled piece of paper and drawing it there are no names for all of these edges and so you go into the non verbal part of your brain into the visual part of your brain and sometimes it can take five minutes ten minutes rarely takes more than 12 minutes i would have my classes do this when you get to the place where you're feeling very quiet and suddenly you're just observing this thing without turning it into a bunch of symbols. You're simply observing the thing itself. You do that and you are starting to train yourself, not just how to get into flow, but what flow is. Because if you sit down and you practice this deliberately and you're saying to your brain, I want to identify when I am in flow. And you use this technique to get yourself into flow you will recognize that sort of, you know, does your body feel a little bit warm? Do you feel quiet? What are the voices in your head doing? How are your shoulders? How are you breathing? You learn to recognize when you're in flow. And by recognizing it, you learn to be able to induce it. And That's it, great. I don't think you've ever said that before on this podcast. I don't know. I don't think I've said it on the podcast. Um, it's, you know, what I want to do is every time Every time we do this and we, circ we circle back around to the question, why aren't more people in the creative space that they desire? Mm. Why aren't most pe more people writing? I mean, when we created Life Writing Premium, it was about what are all the techniques that you use to become the writer that you, that you are and what are the techniques that I use? I couldn't put them all in there, but I put, you know, the best I could. And one of the, our commitments with this course, with our, with our, our, our show here is to give people our, the real sense of what it is that we're doing to move our lives forward. So, you know, like over the last week, you know, what we had Jason graduating. And there was massive stress around that, even though it's happy stress. Um, but we had to keep working, you know, because we also want to move, you know. So what? Just you know, I'm, I've been talking here for a while. Let me let me turn that over to you. No, I just wanted to remind everyone that episode 17, we have an entire podcast dedicated to how to kill writer's block in his sleep. So if that is something that you're experiencing, please go back and listen to that dedicated podcast on that subject. But also, I have to say, when there's an acute event 
like what happened in Texas, what happened in Buffalo, sometimes the answer is to just step away, not to feel a responsibility to write. In fact, you know, sometimes I go to my piano. I'm not a professional musician. I don't have any deadlines in music, but playing the piano helps me de-stress just as people who have some drawing talent, but you're not under deadline for drawing and you only draw for yourself. Maybe that's what you need to do that day or gardening is what you need to do that day or just hugging your own kids is what you need to do that day. Remember, deadlines are not. Sometimes you just really do have to step away and breathe and recenter and cry, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, just to, to, to be ready to jump back into your writing practice. I think we, we talk about a sentence a day in Life Writing Premium, but there are some days I think where it's okay not to write that sentence. Hey, I'm going to say it. I just said it. I There's some my, days. My attitude is it's, you always forgive yourself. I mean, it's just data. You know, I don't believe, I don't think guilt is a useful emotion, but I do think that if you miss your day of your, your sentence, it's good to observe why. It's good to ask yourself, why did that happen? What was going on in the world that it triggered this response? Right, absolutely. So, and, and pay attention to how many days that is because those days add up. Next thing you know, it's two weeks you haven't written. And, and, then, and then that becomes problematic. It really does. I mean, it's just, you know, with, with Jason graduating, you know, and then we're, we're concerned with this one contract that our people are negotiating that could be, you know, life changing if it happens. And we need that to happen so that we can move in within a particular time frame, you know, the, the, the period of time where our, our lease is up so that we can get out of it and, and, and go do something else. And at the same time, you know, we have other proposals out and we're waiting to hear what people say about those proposals. And I cannot stay perfectly calm. You know, I, I want these things to happen and I'm hoping for them to happen. I have a sense of, you know, time's winged chariot. You know, I, you know, did, did not, my birthday this year, I was not younger than I was you know, in the previous year. You know, I noticed that, that it's not that, happening that, for any of us. <laughs> that's right. So the pressure is on. So knowing, you know, our, our whole thing is when we're teaching is what is the body of knowledge and information? What are the habits and practices that will actually enable people to write and to not just write, but to get better at their writing and more successful at their writing and more joyful with their writing. And the joyful is important because now you're talking about how do I use my writing to protect me from my life stress? Yes. And that, you know, and, and, and you're the one, assuming you are writers and want to be writers who want to write. We're not trying to tell you that writing is the answer. Uh, hopefully the reason you're listening to this podcast is maybe you've already decided that writing is something that you love to do and you want to do and you want to progress, whether you're a professional who wants to sell more or a beginner who wants to sell. That's the Life Writing Premium course is really designed for everyone. It's basically weekly reinforcement and the practices that will help you thrive and make your writing dreams come true, even beyond this podcast. Yes, this podcast could kind of be considered part of the curriculum, but really this is this is just really for casual listeners. You know, uh, the, the right Life Writing Premium course is more specifically designed for those of you who are in process, who are becoming writers. And if you don't know anything about writing, all you have to do is, is commit to writing one sentence a day and listening to the introductory video every week. If that's all you can do, you will still be moving forward. If you're more experienced, we have prompts and oh my goodness. lectures. So much. And you can you can dive, you can take such a deep dive. And we have a social media group that you can be a part of and find writing partners. We do, you know, hot seats where we actually analyze people's stories, you know, on Zoom meetings so that you can actually see how this process works. Anybody can do this. It is exactly the product that I wish I had when I was 15 years old, 20 years old, 25 years old. And we priced it so cheaply that anybody can afford it. And you can, it's only month to month, so you can cancel at any time. Right, it's so a subscription. This, that's right. So this is our way of, of saying, you want to get closer to us. We don't do personal coaching anymore. We can't afford the time. We're about to jump into the, the, the most, the busiest 
period of our entire careers with, with books and stories and television and helping Jason set up his business all at the same time. But what we can do is lay out a path for you if you have the heart to commit to yourself to writing a sentence a day. And, it, you know, when current events get you off track, having a course like this that is weekly modules, it's just an easy way for you to structure, okay, how am I escaping <laughs> from the world this week? Uh, because it is tough to keep up the momentum with everything else that's going on. And as Steve said, what, what, what we're offering, you know, if you were taking this uh, in an MFA program or other writing kinds of courses are much, much, much more expensive, but we're offering it for only $27 a month, which is, you know, basically what you would be spending on maybe snacks, you know, those impulse purchases when you're at the uh, supermarket or the gas station. It and really, really is. I mean, the, the most important thing is the question, what are you going to need to be happy in life, to complete yourself in life? If you're listening to this, I hazard that the arts, and especially writing, are a part of that, that you would like to know how to be a writer, how to be a writer and have fun writing and express yourself, get published. You know, I honestly believe that almost anybody who has a normal command of English can write stories that they get published. I can't promise you you're going to make a living. I can't promise you that you're going to win awards, you know, on some on a major level. But I think I can promise that you can actually get published and become part of that discussion and actually have fans, people who've read your stuff. I mean, that's an amazing feeling. And that much, I think most people could get in about a year of work if they're willing to actually commit to the process. That's that's what Life Writing Premium is about. It's a year-long program to get you from being outside the industry to publishing your first work and actually understanding what it takes to do this and to live this. So yeah, check it out at www.lifewritingpremium.com. That's the sponsor for this podcast. Uh, we really are trying to catch some fish in our net, those of you who love writing, but want to take it to the next level, becoming right. more than sort of the casual I want to write to the, oh, I'm taking steps every week and I'm becoming the writer I want to be. I think that, you know, for me, there's only three things in life that matter to me. My you know, martial arts and things connected to that, my, my family and things connected to that. And family is the most important. And writing and teaching to be able to share the way we're doing every week. So I wanted to thank everyone who is listening for listening. You help you help me complete myself. You help me complete my my sense of mission in life to give back to the people, you know, I can't I can't pay back my mentors most of them because so many of them are gone now. But what I can do is pay forward to new young writers and hopefully I'm talking to you out there, the one that's listening to this right now. Um, if it feels to you like you'd like to know us better and understand our philosophy of writing and, and interact with us, I, I beg you, go to lifewritingpremium.com and check out what it is that we have for you because we are deadly serious that we've put everything that we have into this course and, and we're we it completely. And we're working to make it better and better all the time. All the so, time. Yeah. All right. So that's so, it for today, isn't it? Anything else you wanted to talk about? That was it. I ha I'm really, really ex excited about our next guest, but I'm not going to say who it is just in case it falls through at the last minute. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's literally a former student. Talk about the student becomes the teacher. He's doing amazing. And, Absolutely. Uh, can't wait to have him on. And in the meantime, I know some of you are hurting. Probably a lot of you are hurting. Uh, people were so staggered by what happened in Texas that it was my social media feed on Twitter almost went silent about it. Like no one was tweeting the headlines even. They were just saying, I, I don't even know what to say. And that was it, you know? Um, sure. So if you're still kind of in that space, uh, treat yourself, take a hot bath, exercise, get your heart rate up, yes. dance, play music, hug your loved ones, do all those things. And if, if you want to use this, uh, this experience to power your writing, definitely go to www.lifewritingpremium.com. And for all of you, just go on and make yourselves the heroes and heroines of your own story. Just, yeah. The way I put it is be the hero in the adventure of your lifetime and share your light. You never know who's hanging on by your fingernails. If you can share a little, if you can generate some light and life and love within yourself and share that to the world through your art, you may save a life. There are people who need you. Beautifully put, honey. Beautifully put. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.
All right, everybody. Bye bye. No, no, you can't stay here. You gotta go. Bye bye. <laughs> don't, no, don't listen to somebody else's podcast. Bye bye.